Um, so um, this is a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST team. Um, this is the fourth presentation in a series of webinars on non-native aquatic species um, in support of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. And I am going to turn it over to Alex to introduce our presenters today, and we'll go ahead and get started with their presentation. All right, uh, thanks, Genevieve. So today we have our first split presentation of our non-native aquatics webinar series. And uh, we'll be hearing from Betsy Gruby and Brett Montgomery with Arizona Game and Fish Department on green sunfish control options for native uh, species conservation in two different locations in Arizona. Um, Betsy is a Gila River Basin native aquatic wildlife specialist with Arizona Game and Fish. And Brett is the native trout and chub specialist with Arizona Game and Fish. So if you have any questions um, for Betsy and Brett, as Genevieve mentioned, please leave them in the chat box. And at the end of today's presentations, we'll have time for a Q&A. So now I'd like to turn it over to Brett for his presentation. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, as I work for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I'm the Native Trout and Chub Specialist. And uh, today I am going to be presenting on a cool non-native fish removal project, project that we have completed in McGee Wash. So mechanical removals are often looked upon as a band-aid solution and not a permanent solution. The literature sometimes says that mechanical removal is fruitless, but it all depends on the location and um, different removal efforts can differ greatly. In larger stream systems, mechanical removals often do not work um, while they may work better in smaller systems. But again, it's all dependent on a lot of factors. So intermittent and ephemeral streams are often good candidates. And some other things that contribute are Habitat complexity, so whether there's barriers or deep pools versus riffles, or if there's a lot of undercuts where fish can hide out, that will definitely impact the success. Um, also, the invasive species present and the intensity of the removal effort uh, has a large impact on success. Um, and that can differ whether it's an annual removal or a monthly removal and um, the time of year that you're doing those, so you're, if you're controlling the spawns um, or just letting them spawn and then removing the young of year. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and also gear type has an effect on the success of the removal. So um, lots of time and effort go into these mechanical removals, as I'm sure most people know. Um, so it should be looked upon as a valuable area for native species. Um, and it should be important because if species in particular are listed under the Endangered Species Act, or if they're regionally imperiled, or even just species of greatest conservation need, um, which we have a lot of those in Arizona, um, then it can be considered an important area um, that needs a mechanical removal effort. So one of the species that often is the target is the green sunfish. So this bad boy has been the cause of many issues and headaches with native species in the desert southwest and continues to be a huge problem. Uh, green sunfish are a highly invasive species that have been intro introduced for sport fishing across most of the desert southwest. They were first recorded in Arizona in 1913 and then they were regularly observed throughout most of the state by the 1960s. So again, humans moved them over. They obviously could not move naturally. They are a very aggressive fish and impact the ecosystem through predation and competition on native aquatic species, which includes native fish and amphibians. Actually really funny, the last time I gave this talk, I was uh, somewhere over here in Texas, Alpine, Texas, and they're native over there. <laughs> so I was in enemy territory and I had to give this talk and talk some major crap about green sunfish. So anyway, side note. Um, one system that green sunfish occur in is the Bill Williams River drainage in Northwestern Arizona. 
And so if you look up in the cutout of Arizona, the red square up top is the Bill Williams River drainage and the larger cutout is the Trout Creek watershed that we are focusing on today. We targeted these streams because they have remnant populations of round-tailed chub that were discovered in the last 10 years. And so with East Ash Creek, Ash Creek, and McGee Wash, um, which are all those tributaries to Trout Creek, it's an important meta population for this species. And so I just wanted to first focus on um, the area in that red box right there, East Ash Creek, uh, before we jump into McGee Wash. Um, we have had a successful removal effort in East Ash Creek that ended in 2016. So East Ash Creek is a tributary to Ash Creek proper and it's a 1.8 kilometer stretch of perennial water that contains round tail chub, desert sucker, sonora sucker, and speckled dace. It also has a wide array of herpetofauna. So it has a dry reach of about 0.75 kilometers that prevents green sunfish that may be downstream from moving up uh, most of the year, um, unless it's connected. Uh, but we've had a lot of success of them not moving up since 2016. So green sunfish were eradicated from East Ash Creek in 2016, as I mentioned, and has had a thriving population of native species since. Um, and we have been continuing removals in Ash Creek proper this year. And so if you look at this map, um, the red is the East Ash Creek removal area. And then the long skinny red box is the Ash Creek proper removal area um, where we focus most of our removal efforts. And um, we've been doing that uh, in the same time period as McGee Wash, so since 2017. And this year we have had three removals without catching any green sunfish. Uh, so we feel pretty confident that they have been eradicated because we've been hitting it pretty hard. Uh, and, but we're obviously gonna keep checking. All right, so moving on to the main topic, McGee Wash. It's another tributary to Trout Creek, uh, and it is primarily an intermittent stream with a 1.6 kilometer stretch of perennial water. So the initial reconnaissance trip into McGee Wash was in the summer of 2016, and all species present were documented, which was when it was determined that Green sunfish were a problem in there, but there were also round tail chub and desert sucker, um, which uh, told us that we needed to do a me mechanical removal in there, or at least try. And so that red box on the screen is where we have focused most of our removal efforts in McGee Wash, where the perennial water occurs. So, if you look in between these green dots in McGee Wash, that's the perennial section. And we have split that section into a series of pools, uh, and there's 26 pools, and runs and riffles connect all of them. But the 1.7 kilometer section below pool 26 is usually dry, but there are certain pools that can potentially hold water down there. Um, but they also have all dried up, uh, depending on the year. And I have a feeling that this year they are dry down there, uh, just because it has been so dry. Um, and so green sunfish are present throughout the Trout Creek main stem, which is the green layer down here, and are likely to be in most of the other tributaries, um, upstream and downstream, um, unless there's a barrier that prevents them from moving up into them. And although I am focusing on McGee Wash today, I just wanted to, again, emphasize that East Ash Creek and Ash Creek have had successful removal efforts. And with this top-down approach, we can eradicate them from these tributaries and then possibly in the future work on eradicating them from Trout Creek proper. All right, so getting into the native species present. So, um, in McGee Wash, the native species consist of brown tail chub and desert sucker, um, or that was what was there before we began working in there. And I also wanted to mention the native reptiles and amphibians, since the green sunfish likely impact them as well. There are a lot of lowland leopard frogs, 
a lot of snow mud turtles and a lot of Arizona toads. Um, and right now there's all these cute little toads that's hopping around, which I absolutely love. Um, and so they also have black neck garter snakes down there, although they're not as common. Um, I think when, well, this is just a theory. I think when the green sunfish took over, black neck garter snakes didn't do as well because um, they're not as palatable as our skinny, uh, slimy <laughs> native fish species that go down the gullet quicker. I don't know, I shouldn't have said that. Um, so moving on, we started this removal effort in August of 2017 and have completed a total of 42 removal passes. Um, this removal is typically single pass electrofishing throughout the entire perennial section starting at pool 26 and downstream and moving up to pool one. And in the beginning, the removal consisted of a blitz approach where we used a variety of gear types, including backpack electrofishing, hoop nets, seining, and angling. And all of them were effective, but as time went on, we realized electrofishing tended to be the most effective. And so all the data that I will be using is from backpack electrofishing. Uh, it was the easiest to compile and analyze. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, a new method, uh, spotlighting at night. Um, and so we actually just did this this week. I got back last night from a trip into McGee. Um, and the reason we wanted to do this is to see if the fish are more active at night or um, less wary of humans at night. And so what you need for spotlighting are some high power flashlights, a backpack electro fisher, and you have to be really, really sneaky because you don't want the fish to be spooked as you're tromping through the stream at night, um, tripping over everything because it's dark and you're not used to it. So anyway, you have to be sneaky. Um, and like I said, we did this the other night and um, just some for results for this part. We did get one fish out of um, one of the problem pools. And so it is successful. Uh, you just walk up to the stream, shine your flashlight on the fish. Uh, they just get mesmerized and they just sit there. And then we stuck the anode and cathode into the water, shocked it to high heaven, dip netted it out, and it was a job well done. So uh, if we keep finding fish in this problem pool, we're going to continue to do some spotlighting probably um, just because it was a success. Anyway, I also wanted to mention that going out at night is also super freaking cool because we saw so many awesome things. So if you look at all these pictures, um, we saw a um, hognose skunk, a ton of ringtail. They were just like coming out of the woodwork. And um, of course, leopard frogs, although this was a massive one. And then also, I, I don't know if this is a striped skunk or a hognose skunk um, or a hooded skunk, sorry. But uh, it was pretty cool. We saw lots of awesome things. Highly recommend. All right, getting into some data. So this graph shows our catch per unit effort starting with our first trip back in August of 2017 and every subsequent effort uh, after using backpack electrofishing. And so again, these were monthly removal efforts ever since August of 2017. So there is a lot of data there. Um, you can see on the y axis is the catch per unit effort, and then on the x-axis is each individual monthly pass. And our CPUE has been fairly consistent over the past year, uh, showing that there are still holdover fish in the stream, um, and we are catching them consistently over time. Like I said, there are a few problem pools, really just one problem pool at this point, where there's an undercut and fish come out of the woodwork. So this is the same CPU graph with a generalized linear regression model added. There was a significant negative relationship with the number of passes and the relative abundance of green sunfish. All right, and this graph shows the total numbers of fish caught separated into the size class categories of less than 50, 50 to 100, and greater than 100 millimeters, and each bar is a pass. Um, and so as you can see, the majority of fish captured are in the smaller size class categories, which is that uh, lighter green color. 
And over time, the number of fish has certainly decreased, um, due to, and that's due to our intensive removal effort. Um, and these spikes that you see are just indicative of the spawn that the green sunfish were able to pull off. And so if you look over here um, at the recent end of the graph, um, we've only removed a handful of fish from the entire perennial stretch uh, over the past year. Um, there's, I mean, some fish we get zero and then the next we'll get one. Um, so they are few and far between in there. Uh, and they haven't spawned. Um, in the past year. Uh, and like I said, there are just those problem pools that are thorns in our side. All right, so looking at some native fish data, in our October 2019 survey, we collected more data on native fish, and these linked frequency histograms show the recruitment that the native fish have experienced. Um, you can see that in October of 2019, there were just a lot of young of year from both round tail chub and desert sucker, uh, which was so encouraging. It's so awesome to see the, the chubbers spawning in there, and the desert sucker were always doing great, but again, it's always great to see little desert suckers as well. And so in the past, we were focused more on the green sunfish removal, and we didn't really collect a lot of data on the native fish species, um, which is why I don't have data to compare this to, which is just includes the 2019 data. All right, so it is also worth mentioning that we have stocked round tail chub and Sonora Sucker from Boulder Creek, which is another tributary in the Bill Williams River, um, into McGee Wash. We wanted to add more chub to help bolster the population as we were removing green sunfish, and they have been able to spawn thrice now, actually, which has been awesome. And so the Sonora suckers were stocked in order to add some fish diversity. And since desert sucker did so well, it was we thought it was worth a shot. And so the suckers are persisting. And up until this past spring, we were really worried because they weren't spawning. But this year, we were able to observe some young of year Sonora suckers, uh, which, of course, made me super freaking excited. Um, and so... The Sonora spawned and the young of year growing up, you can see in this picture, one of the young of year that we caught um, in May. And so they're doing great in there. They're dispersing throughout the stream. Super proud of those guys. All right, now let's get into the discussion. So the monthly removal schedule has had an, a higher impact on the success of this removal. In the winter, we're still able to remove fish when normally winter surveys are less productive. Uh, the fish are just less active and uh, aren't able to run away because they're cold, um, which is understandable. So one setback was when the green sunfish were able to pull off a spawn and the smaller fish were harder to remove with the backpack collector fisher until they recruited to the gear. And since we are consistently catching fish, we do need to continue the intensive removals until we cannot detect them, which is typically three passes without getting fish, which we haven't reached. So the native fish and amphibians have had a very positive response since this removal began in August of 2017. And we have noticed increased spawning of native fish, as I showed you earlier, as shown in these histograms. And there are plenty of new young of year again this year, which we've been witnessing, but we haven't done our uh, complete native fish survey. We'll be doing that in September or October. Um, also, the native amphibians have also had a boom in their population. Um, there are just frogs everywhere. So we do need to focus on collecting more data on native fish. Um, and which we are doing, of course, we're implementing that. Uh, it was a problem that uh, before this point, we just weren't collecting it. And um, we were just focused on removal because there were so many green sunfish in there. Um, but yeah, we're going to be collecting data at least once a year, and then we'll be able to draw some meaningful conclusions from the uh, link frequency data and just uh, population data in general. So um, last thing, there is a chance of reinvasion on a good water year. Uh, so once the intensive removal ends and we think that they're not in there, we do still need to monitor McGee Wash uh, just to make sure that green sunfish aren't able to move up from Trout Creek. 
All right, with that, I just want to thank everyone with uh, the Arizona Game and Fish who has helped me out. Um, I work with the Region 3 office, and we tackle this big removal effort together. And then also the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service out of Parker has been helping us on uh, McGee Wash and Ash Creek removals, and they have been a huge help. All right, and uh, with that, uh, that's the end. Thank you, everybody. I guess we'll be taking questions after Betsy does her presentation. Sorry, I lost everything. <laughs> Brett, while we um, get Betsy up and running. Um, there was one quick question about, um, did you happen to see any garter snakes in the area? Um, yeah, so I mentioned that there are garter snakes or have been garter snakes there. I have not seen garter snakes recently, um, which is kind of disheartening because there's a lot of fish and frogs in there now, so plenty of prey, but uh, I honestly haven't seen any in McGee Wash in like probably a year and a half. Um, but we have seen some in Ash Creek and East Ash Creek, uh, recently. So they're in the area. Thank you. And those are black neck garter snakes. Um, Brett, this is Andy here. I did see one in there a couple months ago. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so, thanks Andy. Yeah. <laughs> a black neck or a terrestrial? It was a black neck. Okay, nice. And Betsy, did we get it to work? Um, I don't have permission to share my screen. <laughs> <laughs> On your end, you don't have permission, or is it the Zoom? It might be. It, okay, there we go. Now yeah. it's letting me. There we go. Okay. You'll be a good okay. I got permission. <laughs> Perfect. Great. So, um, can everyone see my presentation okay? Yes. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a non-native removal project that began in red tank draw, but over time evolved to encompass the entire red tank draw drainage. So similar to Brett's project, um, we looked at the entire drainage, but we had a very different approach. So our entire interest in this project began with an interest in protecting the round-tailed chub. So this particular population of round-tailed chub was previously classified as Gila chub before reclassification in 2014, but it's still recognized as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the species concerned in Arizona and endangered in New Mexico. Um, as I'm sure many of you guys know, they're habitat generalists, but do suffer uh, habitat loss range-wide in part due to the introduction of non-natives. So as Brett kind of already introduced, green sunfish um, are a problem for a lot of our native fish. And one method for removal is this non-native mechanical removal method, um, which is an alternative method to biocides. But as you saw in Brett's presentation, and if any of you guys caught Heidi's presentation a couple months ago, they're really difficult. They're really mo most effective in closed, isolated systems that have really simple habitat. And in these bigger systems with parallel pools or uh, parallel channels and vegetation, it becomes a lot more challenging. And if the target species aren't completely eradicated, um, suppressed populations can quickly recover over time. Or if there's not enough isolation, uh, new species could rapidly, or the same species can rapidly recolonize the area. Um, so it takes a really a lot of work to make these a success. And so this project took place in red tank draw drainage. So particularly it started in red tank draw. Um, it's on the Coconino National Forest. It's a tributary to Wet Beaver Creek. Red tank draw itself is only about a two and a half kilometer reach of perennial water um, with some short dry sections. And it's separated from Wet Beaver Creek by about an eight kilometer reach of air minute to ephemeral water that's uh, potentially passable during high flows. So we were particularly interested in red tank draw. Um, 
red tang draw is characterized with really complex habitat. We've got several parallel channels and deep pools, but its relative isolation um, provides low probability of reinvasion, and then it being kind of a smaller uh, wetted section made it an appropriate candidate for a non-native mechanical removal. Now to introduce the key players, um, unfortunately, red tang draw uh, supports green black bullhead and fathead minnow. Um, but the good thing about red tang draw is it does also support some natives. So, uh, like I said earlier, we've got our uh, chub, but we also have long fin dace, desert sucker, and sonoran sucker. And when this project initially began in 2016, um, all of these fish were persisting at pretty low levels and all would benefit from the removal of these non-natives, particularly green sunfish and black bullhead. So the overall goal of the project is to protect and restore uh, round tail chub within the red tank draw, thus benefiting their conservation. And then the main objective of that being to remove or control the threat of non-native piscivorous fish in red tank draw. Um, with a focus on removing and suppressing them in the chub occupied reach. So pretty simple concept. Um, so here we go. Uh, in 2016, we began our removal project uh, with mechanical effort in red tang draw. So because of the complex habitat, we had to use multiple gear types. We primarily use electrofishing. However, in uh, the deep pools to be more effective, we also use mini hoop nets. Um, and that seems to be working decently. So uh, this project is pretty complicated and covers a couple different waters over many years. Um, so to kind of stay on track and not to be too confusing, I do have a timeline at the top of the screen and I also will have a map on every uh, slide indicating where in the watershed we're going to be, but I'll frequently be returning to this figure. So in term, for simplicity, we're defining our sampling effort in terms of passes similar to Brett. Uh, one pass is the entire survey of the entire wetted length of red tank draw. And so we can do multiple passes per year, but depending on flows and uh, habitat, the passes could take multiple days or even multiple trips to get done. Um, and then, so for 2016, we had four complete passes with the most abundant species being green sunfish and black bullhead. And when we returned in 2017, we had two complete passes, the most abundant species being green sunfish. And it was at this point in the project's life that we kind of took a step back and decided we wanted to really understand what was going on in the watershed, the greater watershed, and um, understand where these sunfish were coming from and if we'd be able to actually tackle this problem. So we began looking elsewhere in the drainage for the source population in 2017. We did a comprehensive survey of all the stock tanks in the survey, so all the stock tanks in the red tank draw survey, uh, watershed, but also in the Molokan Canyon watershed in blue and the Rara Canyon watershed in green. Um, and unfortunately or fortunately, we did find green sunfish and black bullhead in specifically two tanks in the Molokan Canyon watershed, Molokan Place Tank and Bruce Place Tank. Um, they both had green sunfish, black bullhead, and fathead minnow. Um, so we were able to sample Molokan place tank and confirm this, but unfortunately, Bruce place tank is on private property and we didn't gain access in 2017 to sample it, um, but the landowner did indicate they had fish there. And you can very obviously see how the two tanks fill into each other and into the canyon itself. Um, so we've identified the problem. We found the source of these green sunfish, but we hit a wall. There's nothing we can do um, to remove them at this point. However, when we surveyed rare canyon drainage, there we go. When we surveyed rare canyon drainage, uh, we only found fathead minnows, no black bullhead and no green sunfish. We specifically found them in rare tank and nat tank, and we're just a lot less concerned about fathead minnows. Um, they're not as detrimental as green sunfish and black bullhead are to our natives. So not a big deal. Um, and with that information, we went on to survey Rara Canyon. And luckily, um, well, jumping ahead of myself, Rara Canyon is much different than Red Tang Draw. Uh, it's characterized by these smaller isolated pools um, or tanahas, but some of the pools maintain vegetation and um, have sandy banks. So there's some variety to them but they're a lot simpler and isolated um, when compared to red tank draw itself. 
And the great thing about this survey is what we found, we found two waterfalls. So two barriers for green sunfish to be able to move up into Rare Canyon, um, which is really exciting news. And with this additional, additional waterfalls, we could potentially translocate some of our native fish from Red Tang Draw into Rare Canyon and the waterfalls could protect them and it could serve as a refuge area. So that was a really exciting development in this project. Um, Jumping forward to 2018, we were continuing our removals in Red Tang Draw, and we had five complete passes with the most abundant species, still being green sunfish, so not a lot of great news there. Um, and with 2018, we continued surveying Rare Canyon. We identified 23 perennial pools or tanahas, but unfortunately, um, one black bullhead was visually observed above the first waterfall. But we believe that the black bullhead distribution was really limited because they weren't um, observed in any of the stock tanks in the above drainage, um, and they were only visually observed in the one pool. Uh, so mechanical removal seemed feasible and possible um, for rare cannon at least. So now with waterfalls, the possible refuge area, and Visually observing one black bullhead, we added this additional objective to our project goal, um, which is if non-native fish can be removed from sections of drainage where habitat is suitable, then populations of native fish can be expanded for chub and potentially other native fish as well. So um, it seemed like a straightforward idea and pretty exciting. And in 2019, we officially began our removal effort in Rarit Canyon. So we combined several gear types. At the beginning of the season, we began using mini hoop nets and snorkeling with spears in these pools. Um, and then as visibility decreased and the pools just became absolutely disgusting to swim in, thanks to all the cattle, um, we switched to mini hoop nets and Swedish gill nets. Um, and before we determined any of the pools to either be bullhead free or uh, eradicated bullhead, we um, had five successful passes with no detection. In total, we had over 6,000 hours of soak time between our mini hoop nets and our Swedish gill nets to remove only 14 black bullhead, with 13 of those black bullhead coming out of a single pool. Uh, and I feel like this slide kind of nicely highlights exactly how difficult our mechanical removal efforts are. Even when there was such few fish, we still had to have thousands of hours of soak time to remove them and be confident in that removal. And it makes it easier to appreciate other areas that have higher abundance or more complex habitat and how much work needs to go into making that project a success. So continuing with 2019, we were also, while we we're doing our removals in Rarit Canyon, returning to Red Tank Draw. Uh, we had two complete passes and this year was a great surprise because our most abundant species was brown scale chub. Um, so it seemed that maybe in previous years we had knocked down the green sunfish adult population enough for the juvenile brown scale chub to really take off. Uh, so to better understand that, we can take a peek at how the length frequencies of green sunfish change throughout the years. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we have the length frequency of uh, green sunfish in 2016, and it's just all over the place. There's lots of big chub, lots, there are lots of big sunfish, lots of little sunfish, just lots of fish. And then when you look at the uh, lower right-hand corner for 2019, you can see that we had very few adult mature green sunfish and it was mostly these smaller juvenile green sunfish. Um, so we're characterizing a successful suppression effort in red tank draw by having this uh, shift in size structure to mostly juvenile fish with few large adults present and we're also characterizing a successful suppression with a decreasing catch per unit effort. Um, so we can kind of get an idea of our catch per unit effort for green sunfish in this figure. Um, we have uh, all the years across the bottom with green sunfish in blue. And you can see that it's not really changing too much. We're still consistently catching green sunfish, but it's really promising how the size structure has shifted. What is really exciting about this figure is the catch per unit effort of brown tail chub, which is the, the green line and how it's increased tenfold since we started this project in 2016. Um, it's really promising how the natives have bounced back with just a simple shift in size structure of non-natives, which Brett saw in McGee as well. Um, 
And similar to our metric for success for suppression, we have a metric for success for native return, which is uh, an increase in cash for unit effort, which we're seeing here, and a shift in size structure to uh, multiple size classes of adults and juvenile species of the same species. <laughs> so we're kind of beginning to see that. Here's our length frequencies for our 2019 passes. Um, the first pass is hard to really make anything out. And then the second pass, you can see that, that we have lots of young of year or lots of uh, juvenile chub, but also a few large adults present. Um, so we're getting there. It's making progress. They need time to grow up still, but um, it's at least a, a good start. What was also really exciting about this uh, length frequency and all these young of year chub was we do have this refuge area for chub available. So we were able to, with this abundance of juvenile chub, take some and translocate them into Rarick Canyon. So over the course of the removals in Rarick in 2019, we had tracked the approximate dimensions of the pools, the lengths, the widths, the depths, which pools had fathead minnow year round, um, and also made notes about which pools had good cover, submerged vegetation, and other important environmental attributes. Um, and we were able to identify six pools that seemed suitable for chub with uh, three pools identified for the initial translocation. And you can get an idea of the uh, kinds of pools that we we're looking at and the kinds of variety that we were seeing. And I feel like these pictures make them look small, but they're generally like greater than 20 meters long for at least the ones we identified as good vegetation or 20 meters wide. They're pretty big pools. Um, so in October of 2019, we collected 319 juvenile round tail chub from Red Tank Draw and translocated them into Rare Canyon. So pretty exciting to finally have that refuge area going. Um, and we also placed temperature loggers in with the fish at one of the pools so that we can better monitor their overall success, but to also assess the pool's winter conditions for other species as well, such as uh, Gila top minnow. So this winter, with some big help from the Forest Service, we were able to translocate 650 top minnow of the Red Rock lineage from a pond in southern Arizona um, into Rarick Canyon. So we put, um, so that was pretty exciting, and hopefully uh, the top minnow and the tribe will both be able to establish in there. And that brings us to 2020. Um, we are in the middle of our field season right now. And we've done about one and a half passes so far for red tank draw. So bear with me for these next few slides. The uh, data is a little rough and we're still going to return to finish this pass and also potentially do a third and fourth. So still plenty of work to do. Um, but if you quickly look at this slide, ignore pass two and just look at pass one, it's starting to look pretty promising. We're seeing a similar trend that we saw in 2019 where there's lots of chub. Um, pass two, is probably gonna look like that um, at, when we finish it. Uh, so far, we've only sampled the lower reach of red tang draw, which is where we primarily caught small uh, juvenile sunfish. And in the upper reach of red tang draw is where we have been catching the most round tail chub in the past. So I expect it to change the next few weeks. And just a quick look, look at the length frequencies for green sunfish for this year, 2020. Um, we are starting to see fewer large adults present, and every time we go, we see fewer and fewer, but we're still getting them. Um, something concerning that we noticed this year was uh, sunfish as small as 70 and 74 millimeters were ripe with eggs. Um, so we might have, to, so we're planning on bringing more hoof nets um, and hitting those pools that we haven't been able to effectively shock with a sh shock um, harder to hopefully remove more mature green sunfish. So. They're not able to pull off a spawn on us. And when we look at the catch green effort, which is just like I said, halfway through a pass, so please forgive me. Oh no, there we go. Halfway through a pass, so please forgive me. Um, but we're still seeing a high catch per unit effort for round tail child. I expect that to go up when we finish the pass and go back for a third. Um, and then green sunfish. We're still catching a lot, but it is promising that the size structure shift a bit. And I imagine that this year with uh, additional effort with the mini hoop nets, um, we're gonna have a higher catch for unit effort than we'd like, but such is life and we'll get it done. Hopefully by 2021, we'll be seeing more of a decline. Um, but some promising is uh, 
a length frequency of the chub for 2020. And even when you compare it to 2019, you can quickly see that we do have a few more large adults, especially in that first class. And the young of year are still recruiting um, well. And so we have multiple size classes of chub and that still seems to be doing great. Our future plans for the drainage is obviously continued removals and red tank draw. Um, we'd really like to hit our suppression metrics for Tetrabrina effort for green sunfish. Um, attempt to make progress on the Lincoln Canyon drainage. Someday we'll be able to tackle that uh, source population issue, but until then we'll just keep working at it. And then obviously return to Rarit Canyon to monitor our chub and top minnow and hopefully someday be able to do another translocation. So to wrap up, there are a lot of challenges to non-native mechanical removals and um, this project demonstrates exactly how daunting they can be, but how initial setbacks um, can still lead to success in the long run. So thank you. With that, I'd like to thank Zero Proclamation for uh, funding and all of our wonderful partners who made this project possible along the way. Thank you, Brett and Betsy. That was um very informative and much appreciate both your enthusiasm and the work that you guys are, are doing out there. Um, it just makes webinars more entertaining. <laughs> um, so thank you also um, everyone for listening in so far. If you have any questions, again, um, please type them in the chat box. Um, Brett, there's one that's up right now. Um, I know there's been discussions about stocking some native fish in the Bill Williams as potential prey for northern Mexican garter snakes with potential of introduction of sunfish species downstream of Alamo um, as a result of dam releases. Are there more opportunities for us to expand on introductions in the Bill Williams and is it feasible to consider given the high likelihood of sunfish? Yeah, um, Ty, so I'd probably have to defer to uh, Matt Schmiel, who's the program manager over there, talking about that. I'm not as familiar with the Bill Williams main stem. Um, but yeah, as Ryan said, there are a lot of green sunfish um, in there as well. Uh, I don't know if we'd want to translocate a bunch of natives there with the densities of green sunfish. But we can talk about it for sure. And then if anybody has questions that they would just like to ask, feel free to unmute yourself. One thing that I miss about giving presentations is that nobody claps <laughs> in, for a we webinar. Should, we should have, um, that's a good point. We should have a, a automatic sort of sound. Apparently, apparently I need that validation. <laughs> We could have everybody turn on their camera for a moment just to say hi and smile at each other. <laughs> you, know, you, have so, you have applause that is showing up on your screens. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Brett. Yeah. Uh, yeah, excellent presentation, both, uh, yeah, Betsy and Brett. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, you came back from the field, you said uh, yesterday, and you were talking about spotlighting. I was curious if, uh, you know, you mentioned that's something that you plan on integrating in the future. And I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit more about different habitat types that you might expect that to be um, successful or perhaps, you know, not work too well in. Oh yeah, certainly. So um, yeah, we are, we will probably do this again. Um, it actually wasn't too difficult um, and it was fun staying down in McGee for the night because usually we just hike down and then hike out. But um, yeah, we got to see all those cool things. But uh, to answer your question, um, most of the green sunfish in McGee Wash right now, well, okay, there's only like, we get one a trip, but they're only in pool habitat. They aren't in the interstitial habitat of riffles or runs. They hang out in those pools where there's some cover for them to just hunker down in. And so like my coworker, Andy, who's also on here, he 
he knew that uh, this one area was a problem pool and that that was most likely where a green sunfish was going to be. We get up there, we're spotlighting, lo and behold, there's a green sunfish there. So um, we're focusing mainly on the pool habitat, which is obviously the easiest um, to see the fish in because it's more open and expanded. Um, and the greenies just don't typically hang out in the riffles. Obviously, spotlighting wouldn't work well in riffles anyway, but um, it could work in runs and pools, but we're typically just seeing the green sunfish in the pools. And then we have another question for both of you. Um, it looks like removal is a long-term investment. Is this something we think will require perpetual effort? And is the required level of effort declining over time or staying the same? Go ahead, Betsy, you can answer. Um, I was definitely gonna, I mean, my initial reaction is I definitely think it's staying about the same over time, but I think with new technology, there's definitely opportunities for um, things to get a little easier. How it is now is before we can feel confident saying they're not there or they've been eradicated, we have to have five passes um, with no detection, which is a lot of effort. Um, and with like the addition of like eDNA, um, especially in bigger systems, we could be much more confident much sooner than we have been able to in the past. So we're not quite there with either of our projects yet, but it's an option going into the future for sure. Yeah, and like I mentioned, it's somewhat a perpetual effort, because uh, even when we hit that uh, max number of passes without getting fish, we'll still have to monitor in there to make sure that fish aren't moving back up because there aren't barriers in these areas. Um, so, Yes and no, um, but to us it's worth it. And then another question, round tail chub and green sunfish and red tank draw appear to have similar size structures in re recent years. Have you looked into the possibility that the shift in size structure is related to stream discharge rather than response to the removals? Um, we haven't yet. I mean, we're still not done with our passes for this year, and um, I think them being similar for one year isn't quite enough to totally negate the idea that the removals are beneficial. Um, so we'll have to see how it looks at the end of this year and what the size structures look like, and then that's something we should probably consider or look into more. And Betsy, did you guys do any kind of literature review on soak times for hoop nets? Yeah, so um, our program kind of has a standard protocol of a soak time of minimum two hours for hoop nets. Um, but a lot of these pools, we found it to be more effective to leave the hoop nets overnight, um, especially for uh, black bull hen. We actually found it uh, to be more productive for gill nets. Those seem to be much more effective than hoop nets for black bull hen, at least. And this is um, Emery relationship to catfish removal. Um, in Louisiana, we use modified hoop nets, bead nets for sampling crappie and found a statistically significant correlation between soak times and bycatch predation by catfish stomach con by stomach content analysis. Do you guys do any gut analysis? No, we don't. That would be interesting though. And then just a general comment, excellent presentations. And um, it's worth mentioning these areas are not easily accessed and you had to work really hard to accomplish what you've both done. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any other yeah, questions. It's Maddie. Oh, oh go, there you go. Go ahead, Maddie. It's Maddie. I don't know if you talked about this. I may have missed it because I had to get up away from my computer for a minute. Did you talk about the response of lowland leopard frogs to the removal of green sunfish? Yeah, I, I briefly um, went over it, but it has been incredible to see the response from the lowland leopard frogs in McGee Wash. Um, once we got the green sunfish numbers down to just minimal, um, minimum numbers, the lowland leopard frogs just exploded. And there were times when we're walking downstream and you're like trying not to step on frogs because they're just hopping all over the place and there were tadpoles everywhere. And um, there's been ebb and flow with the lowland leopard frog um, population in there. 
Um, my theory is that they die off due to disease or something, but um, every time they come back, which I think the green sunfish prevented them from coming back if they did get something like chytrid or um, any other disease that causes them to die in mass. Um, so yeah, it's freaking sweet in there and they're so cool and pretty and I hate but love seeing them because we shock them and they, it's so sad when frogs get shocked because they just extend their body out and yeah, anyway, it's a love hate thing with me. <laughs> but I also know how they feel because this week I tripped and fell. I got caught on a log and I tripped and fell head first into the water. And my whole torso was in the water and I got shocked to high heaven for like five seconds. <laughs> so, uh, if anybody calls me cruel in the future for shocking fish or amphibians, I can say, I know how they feel because I got my brain shocked. It was basically electroshock therapy. <laughs> On that note, does anybody have any other questions? Maybe you can unmute yourself. I think it might be time for applause again from the audience with that story. <laughs> and we're glad that you're okay, Brett. Yeah. Sorry, that actually made me like, cry. <laughs> All right, it, it looks like questions have wrapped up. So thank you both again for your presentation and your time today. And thank you for everybody who tuned in and taking the time to join us. And the webinar was recorded, <laughs> including that story, and will be made available on the Desert Landscape Conservation Center YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that link on our website or just by searching Desert LCC YouTube. Um, also, if you've missed any previous webinars um, and would like to view those, those webinars are, are available there. Um, you are also invited to visit us on CCAST, um, where we have case studies on the green sunfish control projects presented by Betsy and Brett today. Um, you can see the URL for CCAST on the slide that's up right now. And Alex has also put that in the chat box. We also hope you'll be able to join us for our next webinar. Um, as soon as we have the details for that, we will make sure that we send out announcements um, when we're aiming for some time in August. If you're interested in being more involved um, with non-native aquatic species control um, through our community of practice, please also let Matt, myself, or Alex know, um, and our contact information is on the slide, and we can get you involved with that group. We thank you all for your time today. Thank you again, Brett and Betsy, um, for the excellent presentation, and we hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brett and Betsy. Thanks, guys.